Welcome to the Curmudgeon Cafe podcast. My name is Benjamin Lewis. This week's interview is with Ty Steinbach. He's co-owner with his wife of Thinker Toys in Multnomah Village in Portland, Oregon. I hope you enjoy this interview with Ty Steinbach. My name is Ty Steinbach. I am the co-owner with my wife of Thinker Toys, an independent retail business in Multnomah Village in southwest Portland. I was born in McMinnville. This is back when it was hazelnut country and not peanut country. And uh, I lived there for four years, none of which I remember. My father ran the swimming pool down there. And uh, we moved to Portland, I guess, when I was four. And I grew up in both southwest Portland and southeast Portland. And I went to Wilson High School, which is the high school closest to where I currently live and where our store is located and where both of my children went to high school. So a very local, uh, specifically local presence here in Southwest right now. You should probably attribute the decision to open the store more to my wife than to myself. Ah, um, okay. <laughs> that, was, that was really her idea and I, I remember the, the, the evolution of it as uh, we bought a house in Multnomah and we would come down and walk around with our kids and she said there isn't that much for kids here and then I think at one point she said somebody should open a toy store for kids because there's so many of them here and I was fine with both of these observations but then there was the the moment at which that pivoted and became we should open a toy store and we were both um, classroom middle school science teachers at that point in time and I just thought we have no background in this we have no business doing this and um, Anyway, but uh, we, we did move forward and, and uh, took that leap of faith, as it were, and uh, that, that was 20 years ago. So, Back to the question about toys. I actually don't remember that many toys growing up. I remember a few. Um, uh, I think if, if people were, were dog breeds, my family would probably be retrievers. Uh, we're very sporting, you know, throw a ball out there, I was always happy. So most of what I remember from childhood had to do with uh, with playing games rather than playing with toys. I had a brief flirtation with Chess and Parcheesi. I remember a Ferrari model car my dad gave me that I think was well beyond my fine motor skills at that point in time. Um, you know, a few toys here and there, but really I don't think that there was an abundance of toys in my, in my background. And I think that was also true of the culture generally. I think there's a lot more toys in circulation in kids' lives today than there were in the in the 60s. Um, I taught high school for three years. I taught middle school for seven. Uh, before that, I worked in the Multnomah County Outdoor School Program, which is a, uh, it's a program that's been around for 40 years or so, where sixth grade kids go live in a camp setting. Back then it was five nights. Now I think it's down to two uh, and learn about nature, as it were. So, and that's where I met my wife. And then we got certified to teach, and we were both teachers for together uh, 10 years apiece. When I went to, uh, <laughs> I have a fairly scripted story about college. I went down to Eugene and went to the U of O for my first year and, and the, uh, the scripted part of the story is that it was not liberal enough for me so I went to the Evergreen State College in Olympia which had no grades, no majors, no requirements. You just had to take 185 or 180 hours and you would get a degree. And Now having said that, the, the courses that I pursued were relatively standard. They were mainly natural science. It wasn't like movement and yoga, uh, and there's nothing wrong with those things. They're fine. Um, but, but what I did up there was actually fairly conventional. And so that was my, my interest, which is primarily in natural history at that point. Uh, sometimes I say it was birds, plants, and rocks. And uh, so that's what you know, sort of interested me in uh, the science end of things. And I always liked interacting with kids and um, you know, as I said, my dad was a swimming teacher, so there was a little bit of that in the, in the family uh, role modeling, and so it seemed like a natural match. Well, one thing interesting about the store is when we finally decided to start it, we ended up in a space that was 330 square feet. We're talking, you know, sort of shoebox size, and uh, large closet, and um, size of a bedroom. And we had a month-to-month -month agreement. We just had a handshake. There was no contract. Uh, I still remember Mark when we talked about uh, leasing it. He said, "You know, he said we could write a contract up, but what's what's the point?" He says, "I'm going to what suck the last ten bucks out of your bank account or something. Let's just let's just do this this way and see if it works for you. And if it does, uh, great. And if it doesn't, no no harm, no foul." So, 
Uh, and then we sequentially grew the business. We've actually been in three different locations in Multnomah Village. We went from 330 to 660 to 1,200 square feet. And then, um, so I guess technically it would be four different locations. And then we bought the building that we're in in 2000, and that building is about 4,000 square feet with this same amount additionally in storage in the basement. So it's a fairly large uh, independent toy store. It's a very big toy store. Yeah, well, it's big. It's, it's big enough. Keeps us busy. We had a brief period where we opened an, a second store. This is our delusions of grandeur phase, I guess. And uh, we had that store in southeast Portland in Westmoreland, Selwood Moreland area, for a little over three years. And uh, that was an interesting experiment. We, we didn't ever lose any money, but it seemed like the only thing that was really growing uh, was the rent, not the sales. And, and then when we bought this building, given that we can get to that space without uh, pedaling on a bicycle, for example, from our house, it was just kind of a no-brainer to stop having two stores, have one. It was bigger than the two stores we used to have put together. And so we've been in that one location ever since, and that's been 15 years. We did, um, Joan took a class through PCC, and it was a one day, but you know, six hour class. So it was fairly intensive. And the, I think the main value of that was that it gave her a worksheet that she could use. And from that, we, we took that and then developed a, uh, not super complex, but at least we had a business plan. And I think a lot of, I'm guessing a lot of these really small independent businesses like ours, and for example, retail, they're, they maybe didn't do that kind of homework and, and uh, are surprised at some of the different issues. Like, it's really helpful to know, for example, what your break-even point is. You know, it's like, I have to sell this much of something each day to pay the rent and uh, not even considering, for example, paying yourselves. And, um, so, and then we, we got all of our shipments initially at our house because we hadn't we occupied this, the premises yet. So we were ordering this stuff and it would come and it was kind of like Christmas every, every time we'd get a box. We'd never <laughs> done it before. Now it's sometimes a, a bit of a burden, uh, especially when you're getting like two pallets of toys, which we do on occasion on the same day. And, and wow. then you're, you know you're going to spend two days down there in the basement just receiving the, the merchandise. So. But in the early days, it was, it was all just fun opening those boxes. Hey, look at this. Isn't this great? <laughs> that sounds like a blast. It was fun. Okay. And it's, you know, it still is fun. Um, one thing I would, I would say about that, that space is, uh, and I'm talking about the space as, a, uh, as an ecosystem, as it were, it's filled with not only good toys, but really great people, both from the employee and, and from the customer end. I mean, they're interesting, bright, educated, articulate, uh, caring people. You know, the parents care for their kids, our employees care for the customers, and, you know, it works, uh, it's a great synergism, I think. Sounds like a great environment for... It is, yeah. Most people, and we have people who've worked there for over 10 years. There have been a lot of customers who have become friends of ours, socially as well as just through the store, and uh, I think that's great. And the same is true of employees, where we've got employees who are very close friends and who we do things with. As a matter of fact, if you go back to our first lease, um, we actually not only became good friends, but even vacationed with the people who we rented that space from. And, and we're still good friends with them. As a matter of fact, she called my wife to see if she wanted to play tennis with her this week. So we'd, we'd made as big a deal as we could make out of our 20th uh, birthday celebration weekend. And so we took this weekend that was um, celebrating our 20th, and we had uh, my friend Tom Sims, who owns Sasquatch Brewery there on... Friday night, which also coincided with First Friday in the Village, which is one of those deals where everybody stays open late, and, um, and that was fun. This was in November of 2014. And I think if you give away beer, you're going to get a few people to show up, whether it's your 20th birthday or not. And I mean, there was a point, I think we had 300 people in the store, perhaps. Um, and then the next day, we had uh, uh, Red Yarn, who is a local folk uh, singer songwriter uh, very talented guy and a super nice guy and he came and he did a performance for probably 60 80 kids and their parents who were standing around we crammed them all in the store and uh, high energy a lot of fun and then the, that same day later we had a uh, we had the model for Elsa from the movie Frozen and Frozen this year has been this massively popular I guess the term is brand um, and so there were a, a, lot of, a lot of kids, particularly young girls, who came to meet and have photographs with uh, 
this Disney print. I have noticed a difference in, in 20 years where there's become more emphasis on, on branding and on licensing. We were back in New York at Toy Fair, which is this annual um, international toy fair where as merchants uh, we can go and look at new product lines and stuff. And We've been there probably four times in the last 15 years and it seemed obvious to me that there's much more emphasis on, on licensing this time around. I'm not a big fan of that personally. I, I tend to incline toward the more open-ended, less branded, more creative as I see it toys rather than the ones that are specifically focused on uh, making a particular item or in particular a, a particular item that is linked to say a movie. Uh, but that's the direction the culture is going and we're mm -hmm. part of that and we don't boycott it. We, we do sell some of that stuff but we try to find alternatives when we can. People think of Playmobil and Lego sometimes side by side and they're technically a little bit different. Uh, Playmobil is more of an imagination toy and less of a construction toy. And Lego I have certainly seen move more toward the uh, build a particular thing rather than here's a vat of classic bricks, make whatever you can. Mm -hmm. I actually remember I remember this guy who lived in southwest Portland, I think his name was Scott, we were on the swim team together and he had the only set of Legos that I remember playing with as a kid and I remember being fascinated by them. They had the little windows and the doors and you could make houses. I don't think I knew they were even called Legos but he had this cool building thing and, uh, and that was great fun. Lego is apparently the world's most successful brand or the most powerful brand, replaced Ferrari last year. Oh, wow. as that designate, designee um, and uh, you know so they're doing something right they're very very powerful very successful one of their reps actually joked that they have a guy in the uh, delivery room implanting the uh, the device that uh, makes the kids crave the product as they, as they <laughs> get older well you would certainly hope so I mean that's one of the main reasons you go into that field um, yeah I had a couple these aren't stories from the past as much as from the present, but I have two that come to mind just from this year. Uh, one is that the first group of kids who I taught when they were freshmen in high school had their 25th high school reunion this summer. And it was, the school was here in Portland and so they had the reunion here. And I went to that and my wife went as well. And we were also, this is a residential boarding school, um, so we were dorm parents. So we got to know these kids on a variety of levels. And, um, but it was great talking to so many of them and you know hearing some very positive things about how they had appreciated the class or the classes and um, so that, you know as, a, as, as somebody who went into teaching with the idea of trying to help people and make an impact that was good to hear uh, and you know and it's also just fascinating to see these people grow into their adult lives and uh, hear their stories you know see what they're doing um, and uh, so very very uh, rewarding from that perspective. The second story, it just happened I think a week ago about where there was a woman who came into the store who told me how much uh, she and her son who now works, I don't remember where he works, I'm sorry, <laughs> but he's a practicing scientist and I think he works in a lab at a university in California, I'm not sure, um, but you know she passed on that he wanted to let me know that that he had appreciated that and she thanked me for the time and so things like that are very nice to hear even though it's been about 20 years now since we've done that. Well there's been that saying for years you know follow your passion and the money will follow and I, and I think there's some truth to that but I would also you know encourage people to keep a clear head as they do that. Um, you know having said that you know we did this totally sort of random and, and uh, not secure thing by opening up a retail store and that's worked out for us. Um, I suppose if you look toward the future the, one of the best things you can do is learn to write code. That seems to be uh, something that's in the future. I, I have some dystopian views of that but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean I, you know, work hard, study, be good, treat people well. Mm -hmm. We're operating this store in an era of uh, very large stores and, and the opportunity to buy something 24 hours a day online, for example. Um, and you know, a lot of businesses today are run by 
people who are doing math exercises trying to figure out how to squeeze every last penny out of the thing, and it's it's essentially a um, you know, and that's accepted as standard business practice, and I understand that. But I think that one of the reasons that we are are still growing, I mean, we've grown like 17% this year from last year. You're not supposed to do that after 20 years. I think that, that we provide an alternative to that other methodology. I mean, it's not a math exercise. I don't try to figure out how little I can pay my employees. We try to do what we can to make that experience as human and as human scaled as possible. And it, it's not to say that those other ways of doing things shouldn't be done and they work and they work for a lot of people but for us I think you I think sometimes people get a sense of wow this is a different dynamic in here and and a lot of people seem to like it. Do you have a favorite toy? You know for years I said and I I have a few um, <laughs> I still love the little train, the little wooden train sets for young kids, and um, these are the ones that typically a lot of people associated with Brio. Um, just like the Lego classic brick has gone into public domain, and so there you will find knockoffs of the of Lego. You will also find uh, there's a bunch of companies now that make the little wooden train sets, and they all pretty much have the same male female connection, so you can make them you know in whatever configuration you want. But I love the train set because when a kid is very young. It's, it's a storyboard for, for narration. Kid has a story in his mind. Maybe he or she verbalizes it. Maybe they don't, but they're pushing this. There's some fine motor coordination stuff going on, but at the same point, I think there's this rich imagination thing happening. But then when they get a little bit older, they get to be four or five, then it becomes almost a construction toy, and they can throw in bridges and tunnels and, uh, you know, so they can add some, some depth to this thing. And, so for those reasons, I love that toy. It has unfortunately, in my estimation, become a little less popular. We probably sell half of it as we did 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and then the other one I love as much as I, you know, as, <coughs> pardon me, as much as I see, uh, you know, the, the, as I see it, the dark side of the, of the licensing of Lego, I think that the Lego classic brick is still one of the, one of the greatest toys that I can think of. Um, I just, I, as you said, you know, the moment you snap those things together, that's kind of this aha experience. And I think that's a, that's a tremendous thing. And you can see clearly how it has been used to do so many different things. And now there's, you know, the robotics program that they have, and they're, they're allowing people apparently to use um, open source to share, you know, different uh, code that they, that they write to make these things do different things. And it's a, it's a tremendous product. A third that I would say that I like, having mentioned a couple that are stereotypically uh, more of the male toys, is there's a company called Klutz or Klutz Press. They started in San Francisco selling juggling balls on the streets. And now they're a multi-million dollar uh, arm of a company called Scholastic. And they make some of the very best uh, craft kits uh, that, that we see. And they're, tremendously uh, uh, clearly, uh, the instructions are very clear, the product is great, and kids love to make the things that, that Klutz has in those kits. What kind of things do they have? They have, um, they have things that often incline toward girls, although there are exceptions to that, like the Captain Underpants book. Um, they have an encyclopedia of immaturity, which gives you ideas of things to do that are just sort of off the wall and fun. But I think that the, I think their wheelhouse, as it were, is a lot of like jewelry, um, making cards, uh, drawing. It's, it's, it's a lot of sort of craft-based things using really high quality uh, materials, make a scarf, window art. Uh, mm. it, they cover a, a large range of, of different things. Counting dragon and damselflies in marshes in eastern Washington. And it was part of a yellow-headed blackbird study, and I had to get up every morning before dawn to be out there tilting these hardware cloth wire mesh traps up and then grabbing all these bugs out of them and identifying them both to um, species and gender, which I, <laughs> I think about that now, and it was insane. But I, I was very good about you know discriminating between a... Um, Ishnura perparva and an ag analagma uh, carunculatum, for example, a couple species of, uh, of damselflies. But uh, 
so I did that for a couple months and I think my waders, by the end my waders were leaking and they would fill up with water and I, would, I remember laying on, the, on my back and putting my legs in the air just to get these things to drain and then I'd go do the next trap. It was, it was crazy. It was a bunch of young guys and um, we had a lot of fun. Uh, not the kind of thing most people do. Something else I did that was a little unusual for most people's experience is um, I was a foreign fisheries observer uh, for the U.S. government, National Marine Fisheries Service. I spent six, the first 63 days of the 1980s on a Japanese fishing boat counting walleye pollock for the most part and uh, did not see another American, didn't, uh, didn't see a female uh, of our species for 63 days. And, uh, and then I did the same thing again two and a half years later in the summer of 1982 on a Korean fishing boat. And so, for example, I know now how to say in apparently pretty decent uh, inflection, I speak a little Japanese and I speak a little Korean, and that's about it. Uh, very much a rote sort of memorization thing on my end. And then the other thing uh, that I was going to tell you about doing, I spent one summer following white pelicans around southeastern Oregon uh, in an airplane for the most part, taking photographs of colonies, which we later projected on a uh, white piece of butcher paper, and then we could count the number of birds there and circle discrete groups, so then we'd add up all these circles once you turn the lights back on and you'd know how many, how many birds there were in the colony. One of the more interesting things was banding a group of juveniles, primarily down at Thule Lake, which is by Klamath Falls, and you'd actually grab them by the neck and um, shove their, uh, their head sort of backwards between your legs and hold it and grab their leg out and then put this massive band on them. Uh, and it was, there were probably 40 or 50 of these things in this pen that we had set up and they were squawking and um, defecating, if I remember correctly. It was just a, it was just a you know, crazy scene just doing that thing. Anyway, I don't know, it's, uh, maybe it sounds like a cliche, but I do think that pretty much my motivation for what I do, I would like to think anyway, is trying to do what is right for people trying to make decisions that empower people to become better. And that it may sound counterintuitive when you're running a retail business and your purpose is at, at some point to, you know, maximize your profits or whatever, but uh, we've always tried to do that in a way that's, that's straight and, and ethical and honest. Um, and, and there is some carryover from teaching where we're still interacting with with people in a way that's genuine and it, like we don't for example try to sell as much stuff as we can it's not like you come up and we say would you like some shoes or some socks with your shoes mm -hmm. it's just you want information we'll help you if we can uh, and we try to communicate this throughout the the employee group as well yeah you don't try and upsell yeah no we don't upsell or cross sell or whatever it's just you know it's it's good to sell a big thing for example we, we also hope very much that that big thing is something that's going to be useful and, you know, bring joy and, and such to the family. In a way, you're still an educator. You're still in the education Yeah, business. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have convinced myself of that at least. <laughs> and, and I try to do that. I strive for that. Okay. And there, do you have a specific event that instilled that in you? Like, does I, mean, it, I, think, I, think that, I think those things... It came from my upbringing. I mean, my, my dad was a very well-respected guy who taught a lot of people how to swim and coached a couple of people who ended up in the Olympics. And, um, you know, he died at 74. And there were over 500 people who came to his funeral, some of them from, you know, states away. So there was always this sense of decency that... that uh, that he conveyed and how he carried himself and uh, and I think that, that that transpired both explicitly and implicitly and I think I picked that up from him. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Ty Steinbach from Thinker Toys and I hope you've enjoyed this season of the Curmudgeon Cafe podcast. This is the last episode of season one. I have got a lot of exciting changes in mind as we move into season two which is tentatively scheduled to begin in July 2015. 
Follow the Curmudgeon Cafe podcast on Twitter and Facebook for news and updates about the upcoming season. And don't forget to visit our website at www.curmudgeoncafe.net. If you would like to be a guest, thank you for listening.